Uh, my name is Andrew McIntyre, I'm Dean at the College of Asian Pacific. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, welcome everybody here, uh, especially for, to people that have come from far afield, from Malaysia, from Singapore, uh, from around the country, from across the lake, <laughs> and even further still from across the campus. Um, uh, it, it, it's great to have uh, uh, so many people here today. Um, let me begin in the spirit of reconciliation by acknowledging the first Australians, the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we meet, uh, and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Our meeting today, um, uh, Malaysia Singapore update, uh, in my mind, uh, it is really quite special for a number of reasons. First, and perhaps most conspicuously, because unlike um, uh, some other comparable events uh, that we organise here in the college, this isn't organised by the professors. This is organised primarily by the students. Um, so I'd like to pay a uh, special tribute uh, to Jessica Avalon, Greg Lopez and their colleagues, uh, I won't go through all the names, but their colleagues in the Asia Pacific Learning Community. I just think this is a really wonderful initiative. And professors have their place, but let's be clear, if it wasn't for this group of students, we wouldn't be here today. Um, Thank you. Indeed. Um, let me just uh, also note in passing that um, what uh, Jessica Gregg and their colleagues are doing today uh, with, with this initiative is, is, is very much consi consistent with some other initiatives that uh, are cooking across the college at the moment to try and connect up all our students, our PhD students, our master students, our undergraduate students, with the full array of research work uh, that goes on across the place. So um, uh, this is very much in that spirit, and I'm really, uh, really pleased about that. Um, but that's just one of the reasons uh, this meeting is uh, special. It occurs to me there's another reason that it's special, and that is, I gather, uh, it's about 10 years since we last had a variant of this meeting. And it's worth reflecting on that uh, and why that might be the case. I mean, if I think back to the, the history of this university, which I've been uh, doing in increasing <coughs> Uh, in recent times, and, and the growth of work on Asia and the Pacific here, uh, and specifically uh, the evolution of work on Southeast Asia. If you go back to those very early decades, it was heavily focused on Malaya, as it then was. And over the intervening decades, it's shifted. Um, uh, and if, uh, to, to me, that sort of connects to a to a, to a uh, deeper, broader, wider point. That's and that's the way in which our three countries, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Australia, think about each other uh, and relate to each other. These days, compared to several decades ago, when we all had, I think it's fair to say more regard for each other, pay more attention to each other, these days we're all paying more attention to the various really big countries uh, in the region. The Indonesians, the China, the Japan, the India, all of us are paying more attention uh, to those really big countries uh, than we used to. Uh, and it seems to me that, um, that while that's completely understandable, and we all can pretty easily figure out the reasons that are driving uh, that in each case. Um, if we're not careful, there's something quite precious to all three of our countries, which will be, if not lost, just progressively diminished. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, the world of ideas, universities, gatherings like this, um, can play a significant role. Uh, in bringing to the fore, bringing to public consciousness, bringing to policy consciousness, bringing to community consciousness, the sorts of things that we can be learning from each other these days, and they're different to the sorts of things we could be learning from each other uh, uh, several decades ago, and the sorts of things our three countries uh, can be doing together, can be helping each other with uh, locally, regionally, and globally. Um, 
So I'm particularly pleased that this meeting's happening. Um, Jessica, Greg, I hope you and your colleagues continue to keep all these wonderful professors engaged um, and, uh, and, 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 and get a new momentum into thinking and, and, and public discussion of issues uh, relating to the three of our countries. Now, um, uh, my, my job as Dean is just to be here and cut the ribbon, then I get kicked out and, uh, uh, and Jessica takes over. But it's been nice to be here. Um, uh, and this is where Jessica does take over. Hope the rest of it goes well and I look forward to seeing you all later in the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew McKinsey, and it's a pleasure to have this conference open by our Dean. Um, I would remind you all, before we get started, please turn off for all your mobile phones. Um, we don't want to interrupt some of our esteemed guests here today, and we do have a fantastic panel. Um, today we'll firstly start with about 10 minute presentations from our guests here, Professor Anthony Miller, uh, Professor Clive Kessler, Dr. Amanda Whiting, uh, Professor Hal Hill, and finally, Dr. Mazuki Mohammed. <coughs> so, first up, we will be starting with Professor Anthony Milner, who was our previous Dean of Asia Pacific Studies here at um, the Australian National University. Um, Tony, amongst other things, is the co chair of the Australian Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific region, and uh, he'll be talking today about Malaysia's federal con uh, constitution. So I will let him explain to you more. Um, please welcome Tony Miller. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm an, I'm a historian, and it's probably uh, it's probably appropriate to start with uh, with a, with a little bit of history. I'll be talking about the constitution, uh, but not just the constitution. Um, in 1957, uh, we have the beginnings of Malaysia, Malaya, and then expanded Malaysia in 1963. And this was still in the post-war years when the West, especially those on the winning side in World War II, continued to have uh, much prestige. Malaya gained independence relatively easily, relatively peacefully. It's a real contrast to other countries in Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia and Vietnam. Thus, Malaysia seemed less analytically exciting in those years. And it's surprising when you think of it, to take Andrew's point that so much research went on at that time, given that fact. The constitution of the country was prepared with the help of the British Commonwealth Commission, including a former Governor General of Australia, and it provided for a Westminster government, a federal system with some similarities with Australia. The constitution stressed fundamental liberties and the assurance that all persons are equal before the law and entitled to equal protection of the law. The legal system was very much British influenced, drawing upon British common law. The Prime Minister, Tunku Abdul Rahman, was a charming Cambridge educated prince who won the respect of many in the uh, departing British leadership and pursued a foreign policy largely supportive of Western interests. With its particular strengths in rubber and tin production, Malaya struck many a casual observer as being on a fairly secure path of development. Now, in some senses, such optimism was justified. Malaya, of course, has grown from 7 million people at that stage to some 29 million now, rather bigger than Australia. It has a GDP in PPP terms, which is almost uh, half the size of Australia's. The, uh, it's the third largest economy in ASEAN. The HSBC World in 2150 survey suggests that uh, it's going to become an economy more or less the size of Australia's uh, by the middle of the century. With its spectacular architecture, its new administrative uh, capital and its world-class highways, strong exports, large trade surplus, um, it's got something to boast of. The country also has regular federal and state elections, and although the same parties continued in power federally, there have been real changes in state governments. So, so far, so good. But when we go back again to the creation of the new Malayan and new Malaysian state, when we look at the constitution of the new country more closely, there were issues and challenges. There was unfinished <coughs> business, some going back to colonial period and earlier unfinished business that would inevitably dog the new state and that in some ways continues to be of concern today. Let me just give a few examples of that. I'll be brief. 
these issues might arise again in our discussion this afternoon. The very territorial definition of the new state was highly artificial, colonial determined. Incorporation and the separation of Singapore, the tensions with Indonesia and the Philippines over the Borneo territories, tension too with Indonesia over cultural heritage, the suspicion operating between the Indonesian and Malaysian people, problems in southern Thailand too, all of this is, is, is shaped by arbitrary decisions uh, and it would be unwise to assume that the nation building phase of Malaysian history is now completed. Looking in a little detail at the constitution of the new Malaysian Malayan state, another issue for the country was and is the sharp defining of a race paradigm. Despite the talk of equality in the constitution, the special position of the Malays and the rights and privileges there to enjoy are clearly stated. These Malays were about half the population in the 1950s, with the Chinese at 37% and the Indians at over 11%. This population mix was partly a result of immigration, immigration going back to colonial and to pre-colonial times, but also it's a product of British ideological construction. <coughs> the European racial categorization of the late 18th and the early 19th century has left its mark and the self-definition in Malaysia as much or more than in many other countries. The struggle in the 1940s about how, not whether, how a new independent state might be constructed the separation of Singapore, the forming of an alliance of Malay, Chinese, Indian parties, the 1969 riots, all of these are part of the Malaysian race narrative. There is continued passionate discussion today about race, including about whether the constitution, far, constitutional fathers intended Malay privileges to be reviewed after a period of 15 years. Were the privileges intended to be temporary, just to help overcome the economic imbalance between the Malay and non-Malay communities as it was perceived? Against this view, some have spoken, particularly since the 1980s, of Malay dominance, of continuing Malay dominance, of Tuan, Tuan Malayu, as a continuing feature of the country. Others again, including a, uh, a World Bank report last year have seen the Malay bias as distorting and damaging the economy. Responsible, for instance, for a massive brain drain of Chinese and Indians and for a failure to encourage non-Malay business enterprises in a way that might have helped the whole country economically. It's true that there's increasing, increasing political talk of the Rakyat, the people in general, as well as the particular race, races, Malay, Chinese, Indian. The opposition has called for the replacing of Ketuan Malayu, Malay supremacy, with Ketuan Rakyat, people's supremacy. Anwar leads the party Adilan Rakyat, the People's Justice Party. On its part, the government has spoken often of one Malaysia, and also, at least in some contexts, it explains the reformist programs in terms of which, of many of which they're have introduced and implementing, uh, explains those programs in terms of how they will benefit the people, the rakyat, not just individual races. In other contexts, in the General Assembly of the governing party, UMNO, for instance, the Prime Minister stresses Malay interests and Malay unity, especially when facing the Malay advocacy group, CASA. The long-serving Prime Minister Mahathir, who might be said to have uh, confronted in one way or another all the unfinished business in the Malaysian state, made his own attempt to rise above race with the idea of a Bunksa Malaysia, uh, a Malaysian people. But in the end, he merely defines the term as meaning that the people should regard themselves first and above all as Malaysians. They cannot, he says, be totally Chinese or Indian, and even Malays will have to lose some of their Malayness. Mahathir also insisted in his recent memoirs that when politician, political groups say that they're determined to push aside race, as some have done since the 1940s, and as Anwar's party say it's doing today, these people are merely pretending to push aside race, and doing this as a way of enhancing their own race. As Lee Kuan Yew pointed out decades ago, there's a logic to communal politics, and it's hard not to get entangled in this logic something the current Malaysian opposition must, be, uh, must have found when uh, uh, in the uh, election in Sarawak last year, uh, the, the swing against the government 
was conceptualized in terms of a hardening of China's opposition and when that race-based perception led to a fresh call for specifically Malay unity on the other side. The race issue, as we see, remains highly potent. A further issue evident in the Constitution is that of monarchy. Malaysia is striking in its monarchialism. The king, the nine rulers, the elaborate structure of titles, awards, and royal ceremonies. I recall a Southeast Asian diplomat with long experience in Indonesia being struck and surprised by this monarchialism in Malaysia and by the fact that it's received so little analytic attention. The Constitution places limits on monarchy, but it also states that subject to the provisions of this Constitution, the sovereignty, the prerogatives, the powers, the jurisdiction of the rulers, as hitherto had and enjoyed, shall remain unaffected. In the words of the current Sultan of Perak, once a high legal official, it's a mistake to think that the role of a king like that of a president is confined to what is, um, what is written down in the Constitution. His role far exceeds those constitutional provisions. Mahathir sought to trim the ruler's powers in the early 1980s and early 1990s, but with only partial success. Today, quite a few liberal Malaysians were pleased when the last king spoke out in the lead up to a Bursi demonstration in July 2011, issued his own proclamation, not one written by the elected government, calling on the government as well as the opposition to step back from open confrontation. On the other hand, the intervention of a number of rulers and the choice of chief ministers for their states has caused much dissatisfaction in some quarters, though evident contempt in others. A recently published book has referred to a socio-political revival of Malay kingship, and it suggests that this involves a rejection of the idea of Westminster-style monarchy and a preference for the type of institution perfected by the ruler of Thailand since the 1970s. Now, whether this judgment is an exaggerated one or not is uh, open to question. But as a pre-colonial institution, it may be worth asking whether the ideology of monarchy has anything to offer to a post-colonial Malaysia. Putting aside kingship per se, the continued importance of so-called feudal thinking in Malaysia should be noted. The anxiety about dignity, reputation, personal shame is one aspect here. Clive Kessler might, uh, might elaborate. Also, the way the economy is organized, particularly the intertwining of business and political activities in the Malay community, the importance of patronage, the centrality of the national leader in so-called economic development, the dominance of the national leader in general by most Westminster standards. These things all seem to be reminiscent of features of the pre-colonial Malay politics. But let me turn now to religion. Islam is another key topic marked in the Constitution. It's described as the religion of the Federation and the phrase has caused confusion. The individual rulers remain head of the Muslim religion in their respective states and Islamic Sharia courts. They operate at state level. The state governments, too, may control or restrict the propagation of religious doctrine. The Islamic movement of the 1970s and 80s influenced by international developments, including the fall of the Shah of Iran, called for far greater stress on Islamic doctrine in the Malay community, and in a sense for a downplaying of the institutions and values introduced to the different Malaysian politics during the British colonial period. The Islamic movement, the Salafi movement, called for a rolling back of colonial influence, even in the arts and in education, especially under the leadership of religious scholars from the early 1980s, the opposition Islamic party, PAS, has been a strong advocate of such a program of religious reform, but in some ways, so, has the, so did the Mahathir government play a role. The Sharia courts appear to have gained in strength, though not without some counter victories on the part of the civil courts. The state of Kedah, under a PAS leader today, has now made it illegal to challenge in a civil or religious court a fatwa, a religious ruling of the State Mufti, or the State Fatwa uh, Committee. In 2007, the refusal of the Federal Court, Malaysia's highest judicial authority, to overrule the Islamic Court with respect to an issue about conversion out of Islam was seen as an ominous development on the part of those anxious to defend the civil legal system, as was the 2009 case of a young woman sentenced to a whipping when caught drinking <coughs> in the state of Bahama. Islam, a monarchy, race, all of these in the 1957 Constitution, potent issues, unsettling ones, 
business that would have to be attended to in the independent state. They all remain potent, and today they must be handled in a new international context in which the constitutional principles and social values that were influential in the 1950s are no longer endorsed by a hegemonic West. Moderate is a word used often in Najib's Malaysia today, particularly by the Prime Minister himself. And it's combined with a foreign policy, a foreign policy posture sympathetic to Western countries, including Australia. There's also an extraordinary emphasis being placed on national development, on moving forward to become a high-income country by the year 2020. Some of those at present seeking to advise the Malaysian government how to achieve such development aims do so in a culture-free, history-free format. They ignore the type of unfinished business I've been discussing, and for this reason, their advice may well be flawed. Looking to the future, despite the current talk about moderation and development, Malaysia still has a lot to argue about, including the issues of 1957. And let me end on the note of argument. Malaysia may not be the most democratic of countries, but it must be one of the most political. Politics attracts their passion that Australians might uh, really uh, reserve for sport. The political debate is not just about personalities and power, but also about the deeper themes which I've been discussing. So much of the debate seems aggressive and divisive. But the national conversation appears to encompass the whole society, the advocates of numerous parties and ethnic groups, all types of social movements, religious leaders, even royalty. And for this reason, encompassing the whole of society in this way, this political debate, this intensely lively public sphere, may actually be promoting a curious form of national unity. So there would be a note of optimism on which to conclude. much, Professor Milner. Um, you raised some issues of race, religion, cultural development and self-perception that I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about today. Um, next up we have uh, uh, next up we have Professor Clive Kessler who is from the University of New South Wales. He received his PhD in London and Thank you and Thanks especially to Greg and the organizer of the conference. And thanks to Tony for giving the optimistic view because I think that also needs to be heard, not that I buy it. <laughs> um, I'm here to deliver a different story, which I'll say that I fear and I worry. I fear and worry, in particular, that UMNO BN no longer knows how to win popular support in an election. And on the evidence so far, it has not yet learned how to lose or how to live with less than decisive or satisfactory victory. Even that, it sees, is likely to see as defeat. I worry as the next elections approach and what the possible outcomes might be. I see five. A decisive UMNO BN win, which I think unlikely and a decisive Pakatan opposition win, which I see as being unlikely. Not only unlikely, if either of these things happened, they would be seen as improbable, illegitimate, procured by chicanery. So we are left with the three intermediate options. A narrow Amno Bien victory, a narrow opposition victory, which I thought extremely unlikely, but the more I've seen the UMNO be in bungling and stumbling, the less unlikely it seems to me to be. And the third is some kind of indecisive outcome, a hung parliament, and I need not tell anybody in Canberra what that means. <laughs> and by the way, it is in Tony Abbott's character to kick heads. I've seen it on a football field. Some of us do know. I see those as five, those two <coughs> most likely outcomes, any of which, all of which are displeasing to important people, in, important elements in some way, and will not be accepted, uh, will not be lived with happily. I see all of them as 
inherently uh, unwelcome and dangerous for the current Prime Minister. Anything less than a decisive victory for Amno BN, I think, will be near fatal for him. And I can't see, except by uh, extraordinary means, his getting an overwhelming victory in, in any election. As we all know, the Malaysian political electoral field is not a level playing field, and it would have to be even far less level than in the past for that kind of vic decisive victory to occur. Even if that's not the case, that's what many people believe, and so they would not accept it. So, in any of those circumstances, I believe that Najib's position would come into question, and that is likely to lead to a very unpleasant civil war within the UMNO. I'll say something about that, a Malay civil war within the UMNO. I will come back to that point shortly, but let me ask, how did things come to this pass? Well, the writing has been certain on the wall since 2008. That is when, among others, I wrote an article whose title I've borrowed from my talk today, which I said, is this UMNO's, UMNO BN's last hurrah, its last campaign? Can UMNO BN win again? And laid out that the writing was now clearly on the wall and that Malaysia, as before, would, could only effectively be governed on par, so far, the evidence suggested, by a government that centred on a progressive, centrist, ethnically inclusive, potentially post-ethnic UMNO, which were required to move to the centre, but if it, if it sought in the short run to shore up its position with the Malay hardcore vote, then this would be, this was not a promising direction. UMNO had that challenge, I'll say why it declined, why I think it declined it. And so the challenge is now handed to others, namely the opposition, the challenge of seeking to show that it can rule from the centre. The challenge, UMNO has forsaken that, it's now up to the opposition to show that it is a potential govern, government of the centre, and it's also up then, up to, will be up to UMNO BN, if that happens, to show that it can accept and live with that situation. Well, how has this all come about? We are, now, we are now facing, and have been since 2008, the end of the Malaysia's second post-independence political dispensation, and we're awaiting to see what the third will be. UMNO had the chance to seize the initiative to do that, to declare what it was, but that's been history's gambit decline. The first post-independence dispensation ended bloodily following the 1969 elections, which I remind you was not a story of race riots, that is the convenient cliche that no respectable social scientist should accept. The electoral outcome produced and showed revealed a fundamental regime crisis whose external manifestation part of it was those riots in the street but it was not a right, it was a regime crisis. In response to that, a second post-independence dispensation was created, designed to last for 20 years from 1970 to 1990. It was based upon the NEP, pro-Malay affirmative action, since it was seen as the source of that regime crisis was a feeling of Malay marginalization. Um, and secondly, the new political order, the BN, the BN, the BN coalition. That, that's, those arrangements were designed to last till 1990. From the mid-1980s on, there was a debate. After NEP, what? Well, NEP went, lived on as NDP, and a few people could tell the difference, and not many people couldn't. The form of Malay ascended government, the strong Malay centered, Malay focused government that was necessary to drive NEP, lived on and was provided with a new rationale, that provided by Abdullah Ahmad from 1986 in the notion of Ketwanan Malay, of Malay ascendancy. And this notion of Malay ascendancy was read back into the Constitution as if it had been there, which it had not been, and as if Malay ascendancy was part of an implied or implicit social contract, whereas the implicit, the implicit social contract in the Modeka agreements provided for something else. But that dispensation, that was, that was, with that, the second dispensation was given, was extended. It was extended through the boom years until the Asian economic crisis, uh, 
the economic, uh, well, the economic crisis, reformasi. Dr. Mahati had to show that to restore his legacy, he remained in power uh, until the political situation could be restored, the economic situation could be restored, and then and only then did he hand over to a nominated citizen, to a successor, Abdullah Badawi, who went to an election and got a result which was not, which was a reprieve and a probation, issued with a great sigh of relief that a period that had been very good, that perhaps lasted a little too long, was now over. Now, what I'm saying is then that the second post merdeka dispensation, because of the economic crisis and, uh, and Dr. Mahathir's need to stay on, that second post merdeka dispensation enjoyed an unnaturally prolonged afterlife. It hung on like a ghost, hung on like a ghost and a ghoul. It hung on haunting the country in a sense. And the significance of the 2008 elections was simply that a whole range of gathering social forces that have been developing at least since 1990, possibly since 1970, uh, but which had up till then been contained within the overarching political framework, had suddenly grown so strong and the old dispensation become so sufficiently problematic that the mere expression of those new forces in a forthright and exuberant way showed that the old political formula was kaput, kaduk, defunct, exhausted, no longer serviceable. How did this happen? In short, the conversion, uh, the redefinition of uh, the, the Abdullah Ahmad redefinition of the previous political logic as Katwana Malay offended non-Malays increasingly with the florid, exaggerated exhibition, symbolic affirmations of that notion with the unsheathing of the Chris and so on. But more than that, the UMNO died of its own success, we might say. The success of the NEP was to produce a staggering diversification of Malay, Peninsular Malay society, socially, culturally, educationally, edu politically, etc., etc., a diversification that made the whole notion of gov of UMNO continuing to exert dominance on the base of Malay unity problematic, dubious. And the two ways that were, that were sought, that were attempted to hold this political coalition, to hold this notion of the Malay situation, and you don't have to be a postmodernist to question the the in that. Many of us pre-postmodernists question, have been questioning the the there for, for generations, for decades. Um, the way the attempt of was either uh, a notion of either religion or, or, or national culture as a way of, of, countervailing, of countervailing forces to the political diversification of Malay society. Okay. So the any, the, and I wrote, this is not a surprise, I wrote about this in 1999 after the 1999 elections, that the UMNO was, the UMNO was the, 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 the Malay social base upon which UMNO based its dominance was contracting. Malay society was growing beyond its reach. That, that the UMNO was becoming increasingly capable of accommodating, of responding, and dealing and making its own the very social diversification that was the staggering success of its own best policies. Okay. So what happened then was that these forces uh, expressed themselves at the time of the election producing great optimism, producing great optimism among opposition, among opposition people who, uh, who saw the, who felt encouraged by this expression of social forces but, but new social forces but did not see the danger of resistance that. Meanwhile, the basic Malay the, the dominant Malay reaction to this was, that was to see the same situation, to see that the old, the old framework was exhausted, was finished, but to see it as an act of betrayal and desertion. That somehow the expression of these new forces was seen as the repudiation of an entitlement to continue non-Malay acceptance of the terms of Malay dominance and the Malay right to continue redefining indefinitely the terms of that dominance 
that many Malays have been con been con become convinced because of the Abdullah Ahmad Ketwana Malay notion had been originally part of the the Merdeka deal, the Merdeka, the sacred Merdeka agreement. <coughs> okay. I'm nearly there. So, I think that under any of the three likely outcomes, Najib's survival is, there's a big question mark. The question mark is after Najib, not simply who, but what and how. I see the like, in this, I see the likeliest outcome, let me quote um, a leading Malay professional uh, who sent me a message the other day, I foresee a pas amno tayap leading to an authoritarian theocratic state. In other words, and I said, once again, with much pain and agony, heartache and fearfulness, I have to say I agree that unless the likeliest outcome, and here I put this question to Dr. Marzuki to hear, see what his response was, the likeliest outcome to any significant amno being set setback is that. It has always been Pasa's strategy, as I've been saying since 1969, not so much to come to power by itself by way of elections, but to make itself and the popular mass Malay support that it can command, and so withhold from or deny UMNO, so indispensable electorally to UMNO that UMNO will have to come to terms with Pas. That is to say, Pas is and has always been ready to let UMNO rule if and so long as UMNO is ready to rule on Pass's terms. When that reconfiguration of the political kaleidoscope starts to occur, some of UMNO will leave for others, George DPA, PKR, DPA, DAP or whatever. Some of Pass will leave to resituate themselves with the opposition. But most of Pass and most of UMNO will come together to work out the terms. In that kind of situation, we know who will be riding high and others presumably will have to get ready for it to adapt themselves to it. We in Sydney don't worry so much about these things, but I suggest that certainly people in Canberra will have to think what an Australian response to that kind of situation would be. Give me one more second there. To say that this then is cons I, uh, an Australian diplomat in Kuala Lumpur some years ago was trying to situate pass in political, in policy terms. He had this graph and he couldn't do it nicely. And I, and it, I tried to explain him why. And I said, PAS has objectives, and the ultimate objective of an Islamic state, Islamic law, Hudud, etc. It has strategies. It is flexible. It is opportunistic, not in the pejorative sense, but in the way that evolution is opportunistic. It goes with the flow. But PAS has no policies in the middle. It will accommodate to whatever policies are needed in order to move in that kind of situation. Uh, I say that uh, I fear I fear for the future. I fear in particular what I can call the Tanda, to refer to the recent movie, the Tanda Putri option. This movie, if those of you don't know, is not simply, although it's that too, an attempt to, a revisionist attempt to rewrite what happened in 1969, nor is it simply a partisan and selective attempt to allocate responsibility. It is prospective and looking forward. It is attempting to to prepare people in advance, should things go wrong, for the idea that if once again, either before, during, or after, or instead of the elections, the situation becomes untenable for UMNO, that it may just be time for the rule of two or three good, strong Malay men operating through another National Operations Council. If that happens, that, and not the new democratization, will be Malaysia's post merdeka dispensation, Mark III. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and next up we'll have uh, Amanda Whiting from the Faculty of Law of the University of Melbourne. Um, Amanda is currently uh, looking into the history of the legal profession in Malaysia and she is the Associate Di Director of the Asian Law Centre. So please welcome Professor Amanda Whiting. All right, thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you. Um, comrades, please do this. Um, I'm speaking today as a lawyer, not the historian I was trained to be, but the lawyer I've recently become. Um, and so what I will be doing is taking you through the legal reforms, uh, imagine scare quotes, are our reforms. Um, 
I'm going to speak very fast because I've written too much and I won't be giving examples of the horror stories that I tell you, but I've, I have a fully written paper. Um, if, um, so I won't be giving examples, but I can take questions on examples if you would like some documentary evidence to support the fairly broad sweeping claims I'm about to make. So until June this year, Malaysia had been in an almost continual state of emergency for more than 60 years. The Federal Constitution of Independent Malaya, subsequently Malaysia, makes express and detailed provision for the declaration of emergency in Article 150 and for Parliament to legislate against subversion and acts prejudicial to public order in Article 149, regardless of the existence of a state of emergency, two separate provisions that don't need each other to work. Under Article 150, while a proclamation of emergency is in force, the executive can make ordinances and Parliament may pass acts that are inconsistent with or override any other law or the provisions of the Constitution itself, including civil and political rights. The only exception to this extraordinarily wide power is that the emergency laws can't touch on the constitutional provisions that protect, and you know what they are, of course, Islamic law, um, Malay native customs, citizenship for everybody, um, language and religion. Under Article 149, Parliament can make laws to prevent or combat threats to public order that are inconsistent with constitutional, civil and political liberties, but not freedom of religion. The internal security law, for example, was made under that provision. Five states of emergency have been proclaimed, four of them since independence. Um, Malaysia was in a state of emergency when the constitution was negotiated and drafted. This has led to a normalisation of crisis within the political and legal system and created, in the words of one constitutional scholar, a sense that the rule of law is simply one option rather than the entire basis of the constitutional order. I would go even further than that and say that the federal constitution, by permitting and entrenching emergency legality in Articles 149 and 150, contains within itself the source of permanent instability and self-contradiction. Emergency is not an exception to the rule of law established and secured by the Constitution. Rather, the exception is foreseen and enabled by the notion of the rule of law that the Malaysian Constitution enshrines. So any assessment of the law reform which has taken place um, since last September, uh, any assessment of that must take into account, I think, the continued existence of the propensity to declare states of emergency, the capacity to declare states of emergency that exist in the Constitution. Okay, speeding up now because that took too long. In addition, the civil and political rights in part two of the Constitution uh, contain their own exceptions and they permit Parliament to derogate from them. So freedom of speech, assembly and association can be limited by other statutes uh, as Parliament deems fit. Now this isn't unusual. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the European Convention on Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, these things all accept that rights to freedom of speech and so on may need to be balanced against other rights and should be. Um, it's the way that this has taken place in, within Malaysia, in particular the ethnic and religious slant to those exceptions that is uh, the cause for concern. Um, and so the draconian laws that I'm now going to quickly talk about and their um, in part repeal um, has to be understood in that context as well. So, draconian laws, they are unjust, disproportionately severe and arbitrary. When, Malaysia, when Malaysians speak of the draconian laws they wish to see repealed, they typically list the statutes and regulations that derogate from freedom of expression, expression, association, assembly and due process. Apart from detention without trial under the Internal Security Act, which usually tops the list, these include but are not limited to the Sedition Act, used to restrict critical discussion of government policies and sensitive issues, which is race and religion in particular, and the monarchy. Uh, the Printing Presses and Publications Act, used to revoke the publication licenses of critical newspapers and books to ban books um, and to keep editors on leash. The Official Secrets Act, used to punish whistleblowers. The University and University Colleges Act, used to restrain student political activity on campus and off campus. Um, the Police Act, which used to require um, permits for assemblies, demonstrations, and the permits were often not given or revoked. Um, and the Societies Act, which regulates political parties and non-government organisations, making it difficult for them to govern themselves, um, as well as emergency ordinances and so on. 
Um, what's objectionable about these laws? In brief, the penalties are harsh, disproportionate. Access to justice is narrowed by so-called ouster clauses, which mean that it's difficult to complain to the courts. Um, and finally, the, the laws are arbitrarily enforced. Prosecutions or threats to prosecute are selective, highly politicised, and the laws have been historically wielded by the ruling coalition against opponents and critics in opposition political parties, NGOs, student organisations, trade unions, the legal profession in particular, the mass media, as well as ordinary criminals. I have many examples of that, but I'm sure most of you know those, so I'll take you through them. Now, last September, as you know, Prime Minister Najib announced on Malaysia Day that he would end the states of emergency, which he did, and repeal many of the most repressive laws. What's he done? So true to his word, he's, he's done this in, in part. He has annulled, or he has arranged for the nullification of the states of emergency. Malaysia is no longer a state of emergency. But Clive's scary story that he just told us, there's the, the capacity for another declaration of emergency remains, and the anti-subversion um, provisions remain as well, so Parliament could to declare a need for harsh laws and to do it. So, quickly, the law reform. Um, when I run out of time, I'll just stop, stop, because there are so many pieces of legislation I'm going to characterise them broadly. The first major piece of law reform was the Peaceful Assembly Act of 2000. Um, this was eagerly anticipated, but when the Peaceful Assembly Bill was tabled in Parliament, it was apparent to everybody that the new law was in very many ways worse than the provisions of the Police Act that it replaced. Okay? It set out even a more restrictive set of provisions. Um, you know, some of us call it the Prevention of Assembly Act for a joke, but it's not that funny really when you see what happened to the Bursi supporters. Um, for example, some of the restrictions, only Malaysian citizens may now uh, assemble legally in a public demonstration. That means the two million foreign workers, asylum seekers, refugees, uh, cannot legally participate in any kind of public gathering. They're simply precluded, as are um, anyone, anyone under the age of 21. Street protests are now prohibited. Previously they were permissible with a police permit, but they are now prohibited. Um, and so on and so forth. The police, um, so the police can still put conditions um, and we saw, again, I'm assuming you understand what happened with the Bursi rally recently, um, but the conditions can be observed and um, in any case the police capacity to overreact is still there and we know what that looks like. Okay, um, the election law, there is no election law. There was an election bill, sorry, no, no election no election law reform. There was an election bill that was quickly withdrawn because it was apparent to everybody that it addressed none of the major grievances of the uh, Bursay movement or anybody who paid attention to the systemic corruption and maladministration of the electoral process for so long. So that's in the waiting. But in some ways, and I wonder if Bridget will agree with me, this is the most important law reform of all. If you can't actually determine in a fair and just way who your lawmakers are, who sits in the legislature, then bad laws are going to continue to be made. So, um, the Internal Security Act has been withdrawn. It's been replaced by something which is a little bit better. This is a line ball call here. It's a bit better, but not that much better. It's called the Security Offences Special Measures Act. Um, like the statute, it replaces the Internal Security Act, the SONSA, recites that the law is necessary because Malaysia is, quote, threatened by a substantial body of persons. Um, who uh, excite disaffection and prejudice to public order. Now that's the key trigger to use the power under Article 149 of the Constitution. It allows this law therefore to derogate from civil and political rights. Um, the good thing about this law is that in rolling periods of two years of detention without trial have been abolished and that is a good thing and we should congratulate Prime Minister Najib for this. But pre Trial, so there are trials now, not no trial and just detention for two years. There will be a trial, but first there is a period of investigative detention. Uh, suspects can now have legal access to a lawyer, but not as rapidly as people would like. Um, so the, the possibility that the police will coerce is still present. 
but there must be a trial and that is a good thing. However, the rules of evidence are not what they should be. I think everybody agrees, civil liberties lawyers agree. Sensitive information um, can be sort of happy, uh, withheld in the trial. Defence is given only a summary of the evidence, not the full case. It's going to be very difficult for defence lawyers and the accused to mount any kind of meaningful um, defence. So that and the changes to the penal code which have brought in a new offence called um, the offence of acting uh, conduct detrimental to parliamentary democracy. This and the procedures around it all combined have created what civil liberties lawyer uh, Malik Intiasoa refers to as a kind of diabolical joke. Um, and he refers to these as draconian. Uh, looking at the provisions, I can see why that's not really um, an overstatement at all. Um, okay, very quickly, the Printing Presses and Publications Act is something which concerns journalists, anybody, uh, not the internet, but anybody who publishes in the press and publishes books. Until recently, until it was reformed, newspapers had to reply, apply for an annual licence. The licences were not always forthcoming, they would be late, therefore putting the press in breach of the licensing provisions. Newspapers could be suspended by the Minister and we know that opposition party organs and the mainstream press have been suspended at various times because they've done things that are <coughs> critical. Editors are rung up by the Minister and warned that the licence won't be renewed unless they spike certain stories or, or print um, stories that are more favourable to the press. This is widely known. Now, the annual licence has been replaced, which is a good thing. Now, once you apply for a licence, you can hold it, but until it's suspended. So the Minister still has the capacity to suspend newspaper publications. Also, books can still be banned. Now, we know what happened to the Sisters in Islam book recently. Uh, bizarre reasons that it was, you know, a, a feminist collection of academic papers is somehow prejudicial to national security. Um, the court overturned that ban rightly, but it's time and expense and effort to go to court to fight this sort of thing. The capacity to ban books on spurious grounds remains, as does the clause about false news. I'm sure that you all know Irene Fernandez, the advocate of uh, refugees' rights and migrant worker rights, um, was in court for, tied up for 13 years, yeah, in court, because she spread false news. The false news was what we know to be reasonably accurate a description of uh, con detention conditions in um, refugee camps. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about the Sedition Act because I've been given my wind up. Um, can I just conclude then by saying some of the draconian laws have been replaced by others which I think are equally problematic but in a more kind of flexible and difficult to see way, so it will require challenges in the courts to nuance those. But there are other draconian laws which no one's even talking about. One of them is faith rehabilitation. Muslims who, who dissent from the official positions can be sent to faith rehabilitation camps in Kelantan for three years in the federal territories for six months. That's detention without trial where I come from. Um, and also under the, the Dangerous Drugs Act, there's detention without trial. Um, there are any a number of other ways, um, and migrants, refugees are illegal migrants, they can be detained. So detention without trial hasn't ended, and <coughs> my take home point is this. Even if the laws were framed better, even if they were the best possible laws, when the prosecution is politicised in the way that it is, when the police discretion is exercised in the violent way that it is, when the press is still muzzled, as it will be even under the new, pro the new Printing Presses and Publications Act, when government agencies, including the police, are responsive to right-wing ethno-supremacist pressure groups, as we know that they are, then good laws will not be sufficient. It's the institutional and political context. The draconian mindset remains. Thank you, Dr. Amanda Whiting. Um, <coughs> we will have plenty of time for a question and answer afterwards, so please keep any questions that you may have for our um, speakers till afterwards. Uh, next up, we have Professor Harhill from the ANU, um, and I will leave him to talk about his many books, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I wouldn't want to bore you with those books, uh, but uh, thanks very much to the uh, organisers, Jessica and Greg, for inviting me to speak. Uh, like Amanda, I think I've over-prepared for my talk. Uh, there is a PowerPoint with lots of tables and figures. I guess economists feel naked without statistics, but I'll, I'll be naked, I think. Um, and you can trust me, I'm an economist. <laughs> so, uh, my, talk, 
my talk draws, this is a shameless plug, draws on a book which has just come out. Uh, I've had the pleasure of co-editing with, uh, oh thank you very much, uh, with uh, Tam Su Yen and Regalia, both at ICMAS, uh, National University of Malaysia. And so I'm going to draw on some of the arguments in that book. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book I enjoy doing, mainly Malaysian authors uh, as contributors. Uh, I want to make uh, five, I want to advance five propositions. So ten minutes, five propositions, two minutes per proposition. So don't worry about the graphs. We can come back to them if you like. Uh, some of them are obvious, some maybe not so obvious. First proposition, uh, Malaysia is an obvious economic success story by any measure. Its per capita income since independ independence has risen about eightfold. It's left behind all the comparatives it used to have at that time, like Ghana and Sri Lanka. And I think critics of the record of Malaysia don't actually recognise how good it has been. And if you work on just one country, you tend to perhaps lose sight of the fact that, you know, comparatively it is really very good. Uh, now, I'm going to look forward and look at the challenges, uh, and some of the challenges are pretty serious, um, but in the process, please don't lose sight of that first proposition, uh, its success story. Uh, you know, I mean, by any social indicators, absolute poverty has more or less disappeared, unless you're a migrant worker, of course. Uh, it handled the crises, 1997, 98, 2008, pretty well. Remember, Malaysia was the only country in 97, 98 not to go to the IMF, I and mean, that's an indication of the country's, you know, since credibility and authority uh, in, in economic management. Uh, it's been recognised rightly in almost every major comparative study of you know, growth success stories, you know, the Miracle Book, the World Bank, the Growth Commission, other things. Uh, so the record is actually very impressive. So here comes the challenges, but please remember the first point. Uh, proposition two, uh, Malaysia's rarely been in the stellar East Asian uh, group. That is, looking at East Asia comparatively since about 1960, the real standouts by decade have been you know, Japan, the four NIEs, China. Malaysia hasn't normally entered that group of really outstanding performers. Also, if you look at the frontier, that is, compared to the rich countries and how they've advanced, Malaysia's catching up, but not catching up as fast as it is by just looking at its growth rate. Now, maybe that's unreasonable. I mean, the only countries which are in that group of catching up really are those sort of NIEs. We thought Japan was, but clearly it's not now. China may be, but it's too early to tell. So uh, it's, not in the, it's doing well, but not in the stellar group. Uh, proposition three, uh, something, is, uh, something is wrong with the investment environment. Uh, if I have time to pick up one of my, one of my uh, slides, uh, this, this shows it to you. Something has happened, if you look at the, the, the grey and blue line, something has happened to investment in Malaysia since 1997-98. In other words, there's been a, a real investment collapse. Part of the reason is not surprising. You had a boom before 1997, and then you, then you get a sort of bust afterwards, so you get this investment decline. But the, the, the trouble for Malaysia is it looks like it's a semi-permanent state of affairs in the sense that the decline in investment has been uh, more serious in Malaysia than in uh, most of the comparative countries. Uh, so it, it's going to hold back growth. It, it's, the, it's the proximate, the first proximate reason why Malaysia is growing a lot slower now than it did for the period through until about 1997, except for the crisis period uh, in 1985-86. Uh, it's not a growth collapse, by the way. It's just a slowdown. Um, but it, it is a significant slowdown. Parts of the economy are doing very well. Uh, my colleague Premachandra Kuril has got a nice paper on Penang and how Penang's holding up pretty well. Um, our former graduate, Paul Chan, will be talking uh, at this university next week on the private uh, education sector. Uh, and that's doing pretty well. Lots of other things are doing quite well. But Malaysia has slowed down. And it is a middle income trap. The important point is, it's a middle income trap primarily of the country's own making. And the middle income trap is not a generic condition that afflicts all middle in income countries. It only happens if countries uh, aren't, aren't quick enough to adjust the policy settings. And so I think that's essentially the Malaysian story for the slowdown in both growth uh, and investment. It's the, it's the failure to reform and keep up with keep up with, with the fast reforming countries in the neighbourhood. And the political economy, that seems to be very clear, is it's related to the failure to address the, centrally the issue of the NEP and its successes and how that's restraining the reform agenda. Uh, I mean, it's very clear if you read the NEM document that there's a terrific reform uh, agenda outline, very clear and very persuasive. Uh, from all accounts, Prime Minister Najib also believes in it, but the political economy seems to be constraining the government from adopting it. So, so that's, that's my proposition three. I think there is a growth slowdown. It's nothing to do with middle income trap in general. It's to do with a policy trap which is afflicting Malaysia's current political economy environment. 
Uh, proposition four, uh, distribution equity. Uh, no country talks more about equity uh, than Malaysia. Uh, and has been more consistent in a sense than in implementing a coherent equity objective, that is through the NEP and its, its successors. Uh, it's, um, uh, and there are positives in that, in that record. I mean, there has been this very, very sharp reduction in poverty, comparatively and also over time. Uh, there probably has been no increase in inequality, some debate about that, but certainly there hasn't been an increase of the form which has occurred, for example, in countries like China uh, or Thailand or even, even Indonesia <coughs> recently. And there certainly has been a, a, a narrowing, a sharp narrowing in the gap between the average of the, of the Bumiputra community and the China community. So in that sense, uh, the, the NEP in successes has been successful. Uh, but surely the NEP has run its course. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it needs to be transformed into uh, an anti-poverty program, mm -hmm. uh, a, a point eloquently made by uh, Regaia, my co-editor in this book, mm -hmm. uh, that it doesn't make sense to run an affirmative action program when you're targeting <coughs> two-thirds of the population, uh, you know, not, a, not a very small minority. Uh, and there seems to be also, as you'd expect, rising intra butra inequality, which is, of course, what you'd expect when you get the, the distribution of largesse, uh, which in some ways is, is, is of course, politically connected. Uh, the strategy as part of that reform would clearly be to keep the good things that have been part of the NEP, that is, uh, the NEP, that is, you know, the, the commitment to education, although some issues with the education sector, the commitment to rural development and so on, but then reform the bits which are being abused, and clearly the, the bits which are being abused relate to the share allocations, the contracting system, and so on. So, so that's on distribution. Uh, it's a glaze at a glass, half empty or half full, as a matter of conjecture. Uh, proposition five, uh, and it's, it's, it's an important point for thinking about Malaysia's longer term uh, development dynamics. Uh, and it draws on an excellent chapter in the book by Sebastian Ryan in, in Penang, uh, is uh, Malaysia's always been a fairly good macroeconomic manager in the sense that it's always been able to pull back and manage crises quite effectively. That was evident in 1985-86, in 1997-98, and in 2008-09. Uh, but, but it now has a problem, and the problem is essentially that uh, quite large fiscal deficits, that is government deficits running on public debt, have become embedded in the system uh, in both good times uh, and in bad times. So you want, you want them in bad times, that is when, when you've got, a, when you've got a, a severe economic slowdown, it makes sense to run a fiscal stimulus and, and run a, a deficit. The trouble is that Malaysia has now been running continuous fiscal deficits uh, since about 2000, uh, since about 1998, since the Asian economic crisis in fact. Now there's no immediate crisis uh, on the horizon uh, Malaysia's public debt, uh, you know, it's not, it's not Greek kind of devils, uh, and has its own exchange rate as well, unlike Greece, uh, but, but it's becoming more serious. It's also less serious to the extent that it's mainly domestically held, like Japan, actually. Japan has very large debt, uh, public debt, but it's held domestically. Uh, so it's, it's not yet at a crisis level, but it's mounting, uh, mounting steadily. And in a way, it does point to some of the broader issues to do with the, the budgetary management system in the country. Uh, for example, the budget is riddled with subsidies, that are about 20% of total revenue. Uh, they're, they're rather misdirected. Uh, they're heavily dependent on declining petroleum revenue, which is such an important part of the, the government's revenue base. Uh, there's a large GLC, government link sector, uh, very large actually, uh, but a, a sort of black box. Um, we don't know much about how it, how it operates in terms of its efficiency objectives. They don't seem to serve much in the way of national development objectives more broadly. Uh, and so within that fiscal system there are some issues. There's also been a very rapid expansion of the civil service uh, and, and I get points partly to the education system producing graduates which otherwise have trouble in the labour market. Uh, and there's of course extensive cost padding and institutional leakages uh, in, in the contracting system. So I think that, that longer term fiscal public, public debt issue is going to be very important. It's going to happen, by the way, at a time where, as demographers remind us, uh, Malaysia is going through this period where the population is still quite youthful, uh, that is, it has a so-called demographic bonus at the moment, but, but ageing will, will become quite a serious issue for Malaysia within about a decade. So there'll be, there'll, there'll be an ageing issue to handle in addition to these other uh, public debt and budget management issues. So, uh, summing up, how would I conclude? Well, Point one, don't lose 
aside of the big picture, Malaysia is still a is still an, an enviable success story. Uh, there's lots to admire about the record, in spite of the slowdown over the past uh, 14 years. Uh, a lot of other countries would actually like to have Malaysia's problems, believe me. Positives about the country and its economic management, which you wouldn't want to change. You know, it's, it's openness, uh, it's good monetary policy, and Central Bank, Bank Negara, a very credible institution, it's spending on education and infrastructure. But to regain its former dyna dynamism and to meet its 2020 graduation targets, uh, there's going to have to be fairly major policy reform. Policy reform, which is inherently difficult politically, but not all that difficult in terms of, you know, in terms of how to, uh, what to do on economic policy. I mean, other countries have done this sort of thing, so it's not, it's not, you know, it's um, it's not rocket science. The yeah, interesting question also, just to leave you with, is what now would be the obvious comparator country for Malaysia, since we haven't got Ghana or Sri Lanka and the others uh, in the mix anymore? Well, probably the most relevant country now, in fact, the long term, the last 20 or 30 years, has been Thailand. Uh, Thailand and Malaysia have sort of had very similar development trajectories, albeit with very different uh, drivers of that development, uh, and they're both uh, facing quite serious economic slowdown, both for, for political economy reasons, but of course very different political economy reasons. So it is part of the, Mal the Malaysia-Thailand story, is part of Southeast Asia sort of losing its economic luster a bit, and the success stories at the moment, don't laugh, are actually Indonesia and the Philippines. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for that speech. Um, and lastly, we'll have Dr. Mazuki Mohamed, who is the Special Officer to the Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia. And so we'll be getting more of an internal view of Malaysia. So thank you very much for coming all this way. And Good morning. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank uh, ANU for inviting me to participate in this uh, uh, Mr. Singapore Grid. I'm uh, very happy to see Professor Harold, my former supervisor, uh, is here today. And uh, well, this uh, event is very uh, uh, timely uh, for Malaysia, well, it's for two reasons. Number one, the election is just around the corner. Secondly, we just uh, celebrated our uh, 55 years of independence uh, on the 31st of August. So, um, my topic today, uh, transformation in Malaysia, is basically to reflect uh, uh, what uh, has transpired in Malaysia um, economically, politically, socially uh, in the past uh, 55 years. But before I do that, I think I would like to respond uh, briefly to what uh, Professor uh, Kessler uh, said just now. It's about past and our uh, cooperation. I think people have been talking about this for, I think, for ages. Uh, for decades uh, after the past left by the uh, But it, it didn't materialize. It never materialized. Normally when elections just around the corner, people would just talk about this, I'm not passing, I'm not pass. But it never materialized. Now, however, if it ever materialized, if it ever passed, it worked with Amno and be in the government. Now, uh, my, my question is this, even now, PAS is already in Pakatan Rakyat. PAS has been working with DAP, PAS has been working with PKR, PAS already the government in Kedah, PAS is already government in Kelantan. If we are okay with PAS working with PKR and DAP, why are we so worried about PAS working with AMNO, MIC, MCA, PPP, and all Barasan National Component Parties? Why? I don't think that there will be a major uh, abrupt change if that ever happened. It's not that tomorrow uh, there will be uh, a suddenly a, theo a, the a theocratic republic of or Islamic theocratic republic of Malaysia. No? I don't think so. Past has been ruling Planta and now Peda. Well, they still conform to that democratic uh, constitution. The constitution is there. Pass respect constitution, and I don't think pass will in the good. I doubt it. So uh, that will be my my response to Professor Kessler's. Uh, but don't ask me whether there will be pass or not. Post electoral pass or not, cooperation or not. Uh, this is very mysterious. We even don't know. Even though we are in that black box, <laughs> black box is always mysterious. But within that black box, there are so many 
small boxes that are the mysterious things. So I, I, I don't dare to give you know, a comment on, on that. But if, if that happened for me, there is no reason for Australia to be worried. The things will be as, as it is, there will be normalcy. Now, uh, now I'll come back to my uh, topic of uh, <coughs> today, that's transformation. Um, if you look back 55 years ago, <coughs> and we can see that Malaysia today is, is totally different from Malaya then. You look, say, for example, in terms of education. Back then, less than half of uh, Malaysian population uh, went to school or got formal schooling. But now, talk about primary enrollment, it's near universal level of 96%. Literacy rate, but half of Malaysian population then were illiterate. But now you talk about adult literacies is about 93%. We talk about teenage literacy is 99%. I don't know where that 1% goes, <laughs> but it's 99.9%. Uh, and you talk about uh, economy, I think, Professor Orkin just shows the graph just now, compared to, in terms of eradication of poverty, for example, and we did pretty well during the independence uh, I mean, uh, less than half of the Malaysian population live above the poverty line. But now we talk about how poverty is less than 4%. It is a great achievement. And you look at politics. Yeah, you look at uh, in 1955, you have uh, uh, Amanda just now talk about a lot of emergency laws, emergency rules, the FISA. Why not Sedition Act? All these are the legacy of the British the colonial, colonial rule. Uh, well, at that time, as we all know, the threat of uh, communist insurgency, uh, well, in terms of the uh, uh, ethnic relations, uh, there's always this, what we call this, uh, the possibility of ethnic conflicts and, and violence. And more importantly, the, the, the communist uh, threat, that the law is there. I did my uh, PhD thesis, Professor Harrell was the supervisor. My topic is uh, law and political control. He said that law control politics. But now I think I doubt it. I doubt that law can control politics. Say, for example, now, when the government decided to do away with what? The Restricted Residence Act. Uh, previously, they do something wrong. It's very difficult for the authority to, to prove it. You just put them, restricted residence. Normally, they are criminals, <coughs> suspected criminals. Put, say, for example, in, uh, in remote areas. But today, in Malaysia, you go to Malaysia, very hard to find remote areas. They connected with Wi-Fi. <laughs> they can even communicate with each other. So you think that law, Restricted Residence Act, is, is uh, the law to control? I mean, in that case, it's a, it's a criminal activity. But politics as well. You think that 60 days detention under ISA can <coughs> control politics? I don't think so. So, partly because of this thinking on the part of the government when Prime Minister Najib took over, and the first statement he made was, the day government knows that is over. That means the government no longer monopolizes wisdom. The government no longer monopolizes wisdom. Of course, in the, in the 60s, in the 70s, you have this strong government, rapid growth kind of model. Right? You need a strong government, the government take lead in the development process, you have a state-led economic development, you have to control labor, you have to control student movement, and you have all those laws. But nowadays, I would say that because of the 
the, the result of this social, social and economic progress that has been there over the past 55 years, we find that Malaysians now are more educated, the middle class is expanding, then you need a new thinking, you need a new way of, of, of managing the government and the society. Well, these laws become exhausted. So when Prime Minister announced the abolition of ISA to be replaced with a law that basically uh, uh, deals with the real threat to national security. I mean, we need that kind of thing. There must be we strike a balance between, number one, human rights and civil liberties. But number two, we also have to balance it with the need for, uh, uh, for to protect the citizens from uh, all sorts of, of threat, uh, the need to maintain peace and, and security. There's, there must be a balance between the two. So if, if I say, for example, really controls politics, you say, for example, Barisan National Government today ruled the country so because of these ammunitions at its disposal. The certainly you will find after ICA was not there, the government will not be there. The government is still the government is still, is still there. Now, what does these uh, changes? I would say that. Uh, the political, the social, the economic uh, the changes that uh, unfold within the society. What is the, the real impact does it make to the way the government handles things? I would say that the government has to be responsive to people's uh, wishes and demands. Uh, when you talk about government in Malaysia now, it's not only Barisan National Government. You have also state governments, which are ruled by the opposition and political parties at the federal level. So when I say the government must be responsive, it's not only Barisan National Government has to be responsive, but also the Pakatan's governments in Selangor, in Kedah, in Kelantan, in, in Penang. They also have to be transparent. They also have to be more uh, open. They also have to take into consideration the various uh, factors, uh, the various uh, voices coming from the, from the society. And I give an example uh, how this particular process of, of, of changes in the society that uh, a cause of civil government that lead the government to more or less uh, change the way that, uh, that it worked. Uh, last, uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister launched uh, for the National Education Blueprint. Um, previously, it could be that 20 or 30 over people sit down and come up with a plan to be rolled out for the whole country. Probably it will take about two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or even months to do that blueprint, master plan. But in the process of <coughs> uh, coming up with this uh, national education blueprint, it involved national dialogues. About thousands of people coming to town halls meetings, giving their views about our education system and how did our education system should be in the future. And all this has to be taken into consideration. Uh, not to mention about hundreds of memorandums coming from organizations. On the one hand, you have uh, Dong Jiaozong coming up with memorandums. On the other hand, you have Prakasa coming up with their own memorandums. Uh, and giving their views about what our education system should be. And the government was promised to be more responsive. The government that promised to put people first. Of course, you have to look at all these uh, views coming up uh, from, from the people and from within the society. 
So it changed the way the government, the government work. It changed the way the policy is made. It changed the way the, the politics is, is perceived by the people and by those in the, in the government. And I will say that this process, you know, this process has uh, driven uh, not only the, the society, but also the government in a more a democratic a direction. Of course, there are a lot more to be done. Yeah. The, the, the changes doesn't happen in one or two days, but the process has, has started. So with that, uh, I uh, end my presentation, and a uh, lot more will come in the, uh, during the question and answer session, I guess. Thank you very much. for questions. Uh, we have half an hour for questions before we break for afternoon tea, so I'll ask everybody to just ask one question, um, pick your best question, and um, yeah, keep it succinct, and if you can, please direct it to a particular person in the panel. Um, yes, so who would like to ask a question of our panelists? Question? Yeah. I'd like to ask Dr. Matsuki when the election's going to be called. <laughs> <laughs> My answer is I don't know. Kino Togo ki the thing up la. saying that perhaps another way of putting what you're saying is my fear for the future of constitutionalism in Malaysia and this is my getting ready to hand the baton on to Amanda. Right. What I mean by that is as follows that constitutionalism, constitutionalism and the rule of law is not just a question of courts and judges, it's a question of having a public civic culture uh, a culture of citizenship and a culture of dialogue or engagement, of recognition of being, being... What worries me about... One of the things that worries me about Malaysia at the moment is that uh, not only that there's this absence of the this public uh, dialogue... Yes, Tony's right. All these different voices are being heard in Malaysia, they're talking past one another and shouting at one another and basically impugning and repudiating and disvalidating, morally abhorring one another. That is not a national conversation. And that's why. To put this another way, um, I see all sorts of important constitutional issues as not being decided by the courts, not being decided by, uh, not being subject of public conversation that the courts may hear and respond to, there are all sorts of things such as the meaning of the 1957 Constitution and the Merdeka Agreements at Katwana Malayu, that these are now decided on the street, on an unlevel, on a street that is not a level surface, where some people shout 
and are allowed to declare certain things to be the case. Other people are silenced and have police reports made against them for daring to demur. And cumulatively, what is announced in the streets, what is made to prevail in the streets, and I dare say, with the encouragement of UMNO, where the, to whom the UMNO outsources and contracts this particular job so that the national leaders can stay, take the high road and be above it. The way those things are decided is on the basis of an absence of civil discussion and on the basis of intimidation and the basis of the fact that, that the courts have lost their ability to declare and to be the authoritative voice of major constitutional issues. With that, I hand over to Amanda. Um, all right, Clive and I are often in heated agreement about most things, so I'll just say yes. Um, but but what I'd like to say something slightly different in response, which is that I think that Dr. Mazzucchi and I are actually in heated agreement about one point, or something he said several times, that law can't control politics. Now, what I think, what I take, please correct me if I'm wrong, but what I take you to mean is to endorse what Prime Minister Najib said. And he said, we're getting rid of the ISA and like it's of no use anymore. We misused it in the past, but we can't use it this way now. We're getting rid of the Restricted Residencies Act because these people have all got cell phones. We can't internally banish people we don't like or triads or whoever because they can all be in contact with each other anyway. So technologically, these laws are redundant. Um, all that means to me, and that's the end of our agreement, I think, all, all that means to me is that we've got to find other laws that we can use politically. I don't, I don't think he thinks laws control politics, and I, I don't either. I think these laws are highly political. Politics is driving the lawmaking, and it's bad lawmaking. I don't think laws can be made without politics. I'm not that naive. I think it's highly political. The socialist realist in me thinks it's highly political, but it's not a rational kind of politics, and it's not a fair kind of politics. And I don't think that there's been sufficient consultation in the legal transformation. So I'm heartened when you say that this um, education revolution is going to is involve many consultation papers and <coughs> points of view that's so important for the future of your country, country which I also love. That's fantastic. I'm really pleased. But the consultation for the laws that I described was very poor. People I know who claim, who say, Najib said that we were consulted, but we weren't. We were rung up on the phone and told about the law. The de facto law minister, Nasri, said we're withdrawing the election law because we didn't look at it. The Electoral Commission wrote it, brackets, it's crap, and um, we're just, he said, Cabinet is just the postman. We just tabled this in Parliament for discussion. Now, that's not consultation. That, that's not consultation. Sue Hakam, the National Human Rights Commission, said they weren't shown any laws before they were tabled because they were shown the Peaceful Assembly Bill and they said, no, this isn't fair, this isn't right, it doesn't conform to anything, it's worse than the old law. The government was offended, so they claim that they have not been shown, now unless they lie, they have not also not been shown. There's no consultation in the lawmaking process. Until that gets better, you can't even have a conversation about the rules of conversation. That's what I think is going on. Can I, can I make a comment, come back to your question for a minute? Because I thought that's a really good question. Yeah. What's right, what's wrong? I think it's a, it's a very simple question. But what's the criteria we bring to bear when we're looking at Malaysia? What are the models, the paradigms? And even when you take a, what's a civilized discourse? Where do you get your notions of a civilized discourse and, uh, and judge the, the debates that go on within Malaysia? Um, so I think, I mean, the follow up question to that is, is the changing geopolitical context in which we're making these judgments, is that relevant? Will the sort of criteria we've been using for quite some time uh, continue to apply in the next decades? Uh, so there are questions for us as analysts in this, and not just judgments about Malaysia, tough judgments that they've got to respond to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, on the, uh, just quickly on the <coughs> consultation process, but well, it's not true that there's no consultation at all. There are consultations, but a different level and different degrees of consultation. You see, say for example, education transformation. It involves about uh, 15,000 people coming in the town halls and all, uh, all over the countries, different states. There are people coming in through 
what are called these focus group discussions and uh, memorandums and whatnot. So in the end, there's about 50,000 people involved in the process. And when the Prime Minister uh, unveiled the blueprint yesterday, the consultation process is still ongoing. It is just a preliminary report where people can see what is there and they can give their feedback whether they think it is good or not. So the concept, I mean, this is just a whole process of, like what I said just now, a different way that the government works. The government has to be responsive to the people, engage to the people. Uh, our experience, the government is there. Uh, when you start engaging early, then you can reduce the problem later. The problem is when there is no engagement, then you uh, what we call this, put the policy there, and there will be some, what we call this, in Malay they call it, rumah siap tukul masih berbunyi, pahat masih berbunyi. That means uh, you, you got a policy there, but you still hear voices, uh, what we call this, uh, unhappy with that, with that policy. But it's a new way of doing things. We, 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 we go to the people and see what the people want, see their views, and we come up with the policy. So, uh, uh, and, and on, on Greg's uh, uh, question, I think uh, there are differences of views in the society. Of course, uh, the society is very diverse. Uh, I think in, in the socio-legal context, you talk about legal meanings. Uh, what you think is right must not be perceived as right by others. This is quite natural in the society. But when it comes to a democratic government, or a democratic uh, a society, a system, now you have to go to the process. If the majority think that this is right, then it becomes it becomes law. It becomes it becomes it becomes a policy. Uh, so let's not uh, be uh, judgmental uh, at the very at the very beginning. You have to to go through the process. And of course, when you talk about the, the the government, you have the constitution as the guiding principles. You know. So whatever you do must not what we call this, uh, be contrary to the principles of the Constitution, the spirits, the intent, and the letter of the Constitution, right? And even if the Parliament uh, do something uh, which is construed as not in line with the Constitution, you still have the court. Let's say, for example, the ISA. If previously, judicial review. Judicial review is only for our own procedural matters. But with the new ISA, you can bring habeas corpus, and you can also, I mean, the, 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 the detainee you know, can also bring it to the court to review not only the procedural matters, but also the substantive matters of the detention. So I think this is a great, what we call this, uh, great uh, uh, a change, great improvement. And what more, I talk to some, I mean, those who work on this and what they say. This is a great test on power because you have, I mean, the government has the power and you want to do away with the power. And this is a great thing. People who doesn't have the power, they can talk about sun, moon, and stars, but they can't do anything. But the Barisan national government has the power. It is in the law, but say, we don't, know, we don't need this, this, this law anymore. So for me, this is, I, I look at it from a, from a positive perspective. You know? Probably this, uh, this glass. <laughs> it's whether it's uh, half full or half, half empty. I would like to say it's half full, or almost full. This glass, of course, <laughs> very empty. So this is just a process. We're we'll talking about transformation. Uh, and it, it just happens in, this, in, in five decades after independence. Right? So, so for me, it's a great achievement. Just a question in the middle, yeah? Sorry, in your presentation, you hinted that Malaysia's international borders might be subject to change in the foreseeable future. Was that a serious uh, suggestion? And if so, in what circumstances do you think those changes might take place? I don't think I said that clearly <laughs> at all, Robert. But, um, it was an implication rather than a... I said that I thought the nation building, we couldn't assume, was over and, was over and done with. Um, I think what's going on at the moment uh, with Singapore is very interesting, isn't it? The, the uh, Iskander, I don't know if anybody here knows more about the Iskander project than I do, but I suspect that it's really very interesting to 
um, just as the Singapore um, relations with Bataan, etc., it was interesting. For all the talk about uh, the preoccupation with sovereignty in Southeast Asia and how that holds up ASEAN and stops ASEAN developing well, uh, it's one level, there's a, there's a sort of a relaxed view of sovereignty, isn't there? That, uh, Indonesians accepting um, Singapore currency, the, the, those islands in Indonesia. The growth triangles seem to me to be an interesting development, which again haven't had enough analysis. But in some ways, uh, uh, just, I just would not take for granted that we that we have these units are all um, firmly in place. I also think it's quite interesting the role of the uh, the cities in the region, the centres in the region. Um, interesting to see how that develops too. Uh, Southeast Asia, you know, marked not so much by territorial borders, perhaps looking ahead, as by some great and spectacular cities. With a great deal of people movement around us. I don't mean they'll re redraw the borders necessarily, but in real life, the borders are redrawn. Is that enough of an answer? A reversion to the exemplary centre model. Well, it's a bit around, isn't it? And Singapore clearly likes it. Too, you know, it's, uh, it's small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, two, and then three. So. Uh, Tony, you uh, said that the politics in Malaysia arouses the sort of passions that I might associate with football in Australia. I think it's actually probably a pretty good analogy because the role of football supporters is to be a supporter and the role of the rakya is to be a supporter. And there is this, what I'm alluding to is, there is this very personal uh, sort of form of allegiance that permeates all of politics in Malaysia. And you can see it in the, the political dynasties, of course. Okay. Um, prime ministers will, be, will often be related to each other and that sort of thing. Also, I'm remembered, we heard a list of five uh, state governments that are held by the opposition at the moment. There was a fifth and it fell <coughs> by defections. And other splits in UNNO have been handled by defections and redefections, and there was speculation that the uh, East Malaysian Barasan parties might defect to uh, 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 Anwar at one point. This raises, there's, there's a lot of questions you can ask about that that are sort of prompted by that, but the simplest one is, is this not another scenario of post-election, an alternative post-election scenario with what we're facing in the, you know, in the next 12 months. Could there indeed be a fall of, uh, of, of, uh, of the government only to see victory snatched through defections <coughs> buying off? And the electorate will tend to just keep following their, sort of, uh, their, 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 personal, their personal affiliations, their personal loyalties rather than actually making political judgments, which is actually a reflection on the maturity of the polity. Or quest raises questions about the, pol the maturity of the polity. There's two questions in that. Case. Probably, there's more than two. Yeah. But prob probably, Azuki and, and, and Clive will want to come in, <coughs> in on that. Um, it is, what, what you say is, 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 what's striking about that, isn't it, that the democracy in, in that scenario ceases to be important as the politics, the politicking. Right? that whatever the people vote, the, the politicking that follows could be the critical thing. And we saw a little bit of that in Australia in the last federal election, but it's, uh, it's a much more active, lively thing in, in Malaysia. And I think it's, I mean, it's a, perhaps again, a simple point, but for all the, the problems with democracy there, it really, is, it really is striking, the passion with which politics is talked about, but not just the passion, it's just constantly, constantly talked about. And that, and that factionalism, that, um, patronage systems and whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, your real question, I think, comes to what might happen after an election. It should, should uh, Clive have uh, said more about that scenario. What do you, what do you think of that? Well, okay. very good. I long ago commented that for all the literature in Malaysia on leadership, what was really important was followership. <laughs> that followers made leaders and not their... When people jump up and say, I'm your leader, generally don't become leaders. Uh, um, yes. There will be. But what do you think about a situation that, following the election, where in fact you have the sorts of moves that went on in Perak, 
Um, look, so in a way, the vote, the vote matters much less than the politicking of politics. If Probably. the old permanent governing team finds itself in a precarious position and it has that option to consolidate itself, it will. Let us be quite clear that what happened in Pera was not defections. Uh, it was a John Kerr situation where the, the elected Prime Minister, rightly or wrongly, under the constitutional principles that were believed to hold, said, I'm, 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 I may wish to test my, my numbers on the floor, but I'm not confident that I wish to exercise my prerogative to put the issue back to the people and was denied that opportunity. Well, there was a difference that Kerr held an election straight afterwards. Uh, Kerr put in a Kerr... Uh, a, Kerr put in a Kerr taker government uh, <laughs> to do just that under transformed conditions. The point was that Kerr acted, we won't talk about, about my former Chancellor Mason, Kerr acted exerting weren't. royal powers that the Queen herself would not have exercised in England. Whereas, to come back to your point, was that the Sultan of Pera said, insisted on the, even though as a Lord President, he'd been an exemplary constitutionalist. As a king, he was an exemplary divine like monarchist who then said, there is more to the constitutional role of the monarch than the constitution says, and took it upon himself to act in that way. But there now, were defections, weren't there? There were defections. Uh, a defection, that, part of it, a defection is in the context where somebody declares their position on the floor of the house. Oh, yeah, but there, and today, there are constant rumours about more defections. Okay, but the, the point is that to come that if, well, we, if there is, a, my view is that if there is a serious risk to the old permanent ma national management governing team, then, uh, or as Amanda and others point out, whatever uh, people, might, whatever Malaysia may not have great experience at, and whatever UMNO BN may not be good at, learning how to declare and run and manage an emergency, they are very, very good at it. They've done it, they know how to do it. Everything is already up. It's already there. But say the the house is already there. And um, if it comes to that, there is a group of people um, within the core national political directorate, the party, the civil service, the judiciary, the police and the army who've signaled this, who will be prepared to exercise force majeure. But if, if that extreme is not necessary, if the reconsolidation um, of, the, the, of the old regime can be done through the procuring of defections, then it will obviously be done that way. That seems to me to be, to be not problematic in any, in any way. Um, getting back to... to, to um, yes, I agree with you. I said also, apart from leadership fellowship, I said long ago, Malaysia not only has as every place a political culture, but Malay political culture is intensely and inherently political. Other cultures are preoccupied with purity or pollution or sanctity. Malay culture is itself inherently political. And this is part of why politics is so unforgiving and unrelenting and why people um, in principle can say, yes, you have your view and I have mine, but then it in, in the end, it says, but I have the power to make my view prevail. Uh, you do not have the numbers. And after, in the end, democracy is not the right to replace the tyranny of the minority, as Tocqueville put it, with the tyranny of the majority. Democracy is a process through which the, 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 the rights, the concerns, the, the constitutional entitlements and the, the, of the minority can be, a, be assured under the conditions of, of, of majority rule. Now again, as Marzuki says, there's been plenty of consultation top down, the, but the consultation of the government with the, with the rayat is not the only thing. When people want to have a consultation about the meaning of Article 11 of the Constitution among themselves, or about what the history of the, of the concept of social contract is, and people Government supporters sanctioned with, 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 uh, uh, with government, allowed to do so by the government shut down those kinds of conversations. Then that is that is again uh, not a situation in which you can claim that full public consultation has occurred. That that is the concern that some of us would have. Uh, it is not simply that the government will be prepared to to listen and consult on its own terms, 
And getting back to another point Tony made, uh, yes, the government claims to listen to the Raya. I, as I put it out in another context, uh, very clearly... No, they claim to be serving. Them. Very clearly, in 1982, following the election, you went around and you saw, you know, it was the era of 2M optimism, and there were all the pictures of Mahathir Pombela Rayat. And in the West Coast, that meant one thing, and the posters on the East Coast looked different, read different, and the Rayat was not the people in Germany, the Rayat was the Malay Rayat. And that inherent ambiguity in the meaning of the term Rayat, the way that's played out politically, is, is essential, is, is, is critical to the, the whole political process in Malaysia. That systematic yeah. ambiguity. Sorry. <laughs> and Marzuki will want to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just respond just very quickly to what uh, Professor Kastner said just now. I mean, it is more complex than that. It's just not numbers when you are the majority uh, race, uh, you got the majority number in parliament, and you can get everything that you want. It's not just as simple as that. i just give an example. Uh, even though that uh, the Chinese is a uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, I don't. I won't say minority. It's a, it's a very large uh, number of uh, 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 Chinese and uh, Indians in the country. You look at the Chinese education, for example. The government spend about 2.4 billion annually, specifically for the SJKCs, the Chinese type primary schools. Now, if you say that numbers determine everything. You know, it's like a zero-sum game. Huh? Politics is about who gets what, when and how. Then the Malays will get everything because I'm not got number in parliament. No? The government doesn't listen always to Pukasa. Right? You say, even now I would say that the term Malay dominance is a bit outdated now. Because in the process of consultation, you consult. Way from Dong Jiao Zong to, to Pukasa. And in between there are a lot of other social, non-governmental organizations, individuals that have a say in policy making. So in the end, when you come up with a certain policy, you neither listen to Don Zong, you neither listen to Pukasa. Because you have to come up with a reasonable one. Right? So numbers alone doesn't make the government, what we call this, uh, having absolute power, an absolute, what we call this, uh, 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 what do you call this uh, choice uh, uh, to do what uh, what the government likes? So it is more for me. It is more complicated. It is more complex than what Professor Kessler trying to portray just now. So uh, I think uh, we need to look at uh, Malaysian politics more more closely uh, to in order uh, to make what we call this more sensible and reasonable judgment of what's going on in the country. Uh, as someone involved in the policy making, in the process of policy making, I know the intricacies. Uh, I'm not saying that I know everything, but the process is not as easy as, as, as you know, we portray it to be. Uh, and I would say that Amno doesn't always have <coughs> its own way of doing things. Still have to consult. MCA still have to consult, MIC still have to consult, PPP in coming up with uh, what I call this, whatever decisions that, uh, uh, what was that, that the Barisan National Government want to do. And I'm, I'm sure in the, on the other side of the political, uh, political fence, also the same. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. this is just my, my quick uh, response to what you said just now. We might have a final quick question from Bridget Bush. Um, I wanted you to actually ask a question to Hal um, during your presentation. Um, I, I, there were two things that I thought were noticeable missing in your discussion. One was the issue of corruption. And the second issue was the issue of the populist measures. You kind of were backhanded talking about the debt, but the kind of the, we've seen in the last um, two years a kind of regional trend of a lot of populist initiatives, but particularly in Malaysia, as we've had elections, primaries, and budgets for the last two years. Um, and I wanted to ask you to what, whether you thought these things were part of the kind of the challenges. No? Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, I also wanted to kind of draw your attention to a, a very important and I think quite serious report that's come out in the last couple months 
by the Household Survey of 2009, which really shows the inequalities and divided sharply, um, which I think is a, bit, a little bit different in your presentation. Um, and I, would, I think it's a very good report. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, uh, Richard. Um, I, I'm not a Malaysia specialist, so anyone else feel free to answer this kind of question. Um, on the corruption issue, uh, what's, I guess what's new uh, is, 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 I suppose, the question I have. I mean, if you look at these comparative rankings of, you know, Transparency International, the World Bank, World Governance Indicators, I suppose you put Malaysia's about where you'd expect it to be. That is, it's, you know, it's not bad. It's about where its per capita income is, in fact. So, um, I guess, what's, what's the new angle in particular which is interesting? I mean, if you were to stand back and think about Malaysia and corruption, what, what would you think of the parameters which are important? Well, I suppose I'd say for a start, it's a very open economy, so that reduces the, the scope for corruption as compared to a closed economy. Uh, then I'd say it's, you know, you've had one, one party dominant rule forever, and so therefore you've got a much greater chance of corruption because you've had no, no, no political turnover. Um, and you've got a media which I suppose is, you know, is, is, is somewhat controlled and therefore checks and balances and the legal system and so on. But I'm just not sure what's, what's the new angle which is relevant. Um, in, um, and so I don't have anything particular to comment on. Um, on the populist measures, well, I think that's part of the budget issue. I alluded, I mean, I only had 10 minutes, so I had to go through all this very quickly. But uh, I think the budget, there is a serious problem with Malaysia's budget, not a crisis. But as I mentioned, there are these embedded deficits which are just occurring all the time in you know, times of economic prosperity and in times of crises. So um, I, I don't see anything really new in that, other than the fact that it has been a, on, the, on the economic agenda since 1998. And it doesn't seem as though the, the federal government is able to get, to get rid of the problems. I guess the contracting system is basically been embedded in Malaysia's political economy since 1971 or earlier, so there's nothing really new there. Uh, the GLCs, as an outsider, sort of worry me because they're so large and uh, they're sort of everywhere and they don't seem to be subject to sort of the checks. I mean, as I understand it, in the new competition law, uh, the, the GLCs are really outsiders. Um, so, yeah. But is there something specific on the populist stuff? I mean, you know, in electoral cycles, they come and go, and you, you wouldn't be surprised by it. But is there something particular? Is it a trend, you mean? I think there are two trends that are important. One is the actual amount of money that is being spent, which is really very, very high and, and unprecedented uh, in terms of the handouts that are going down at the direct level. The second is the way they're being spent that there actually a lot of it is not going, it's being spent first, going to Parliament second um, for approval and going through the Prime Minister's office where there's very little transparency in how the process is actually being doled out. Mm. So I think that it is actually, there have been quite changes, significant changes in governance and the management of the finances, mm. which I think are new, which exacerbate the issues of debt that right. you mentioned, yeah. I think, and that's a, a good yeah. challenge. Well, one striking feature of Malaysia, just thinking comparatively, is we know, for example, it's infrastructure is really good comparatively and we know that infrastructure is everywhere, in Australia of course included, is a corruption prone activity. So, um, you know, building roads with lots of corruption, I guess standing back, what's the cost benefit calculus? Of course you wouldn't want the corruption that goes with it, but you do want the infrastructure. And if you think of, say, neighbouring Indonesia where you get the corruption, but you don't even get the infrastructure. Uh, you know, to, I mean, to, to the extent that a lot of these things are infrastructure related, which I suspect they probably are, at least I guess Malaysia gets the infrastructure. But, but, uh, yeah. I'd like to know about, I think you've got to sit down, I mean, I'd sit down with the project by project and to get it. I mean, you're talking federal, not state, I suppose, aren't you? Yeah. So, so the main point, I guess, is Malaysia, as I see it, has this sort of looming fiscal local problem. Not a crisis, but a problem. And that's consistent. That sort of behaviour is consistent. Thank you very much. And I think we will have to wrap it up there. Um, however, please um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think it's been very interesting. We will have any more questions that you have, you may be able to ask our panellists in the break. Um, we will now have a break for afternoon tea before we start our Singapore session. Um, however, I'd like you to implore you to come back uh, at 4 o'clock for the Singapore session. At 3 o'clock.
at three o'clock, sorry. Um, it's not that late. And also, again tonight at 7.30 p.m. at Bruce Hall, we'll be having a combined forum entitled Malaysia and Singapore Models for the Asian Century. Um, as coordinator of the Asia Pacific Learning Community and tonight's event, I'll implore you to come along to that mm -hmm. and you'll be able to see some of our panellists together debating um, the comparative view of these two countries that we're looking at in today's update forum. Um, thank you very much everybody, thank you to our speakers today and thank you to the people that have put so much work into organising and funding this. Um, so, thank you.